Oh, I didn't turn the cross on. I know most you can barely even see on the camera, but I like to have the cross lit up right here. It looks like part of it's oh. all that cross. <laughs> That makes me happy. Doesn't look like part of the lights out on the left side up there. It is. Oh. It comes loose. You got to climb up in there and wiggle it. Every once in a while, it turns out. No. Mm -hmm. I just pretend the cross is laying at me. All right, we are on. We got people watching. Looks like we're ready to roll. So uh, I want to start with a couple announcements. I'm just going to run through quick. You can stop me if you have any questions. Uh, April 23rd is food pantry. So from 8.30 in the morning to 11.30 here at church, everybody's welcome. Um, you can take boxes for a friend or neighbor if you want to pick up food for somebody else. We'd be happy to accommodate that. If you'd like to make donations, um, probably easier to say things we don't need. We don't need mac and cheese. We don't need jelly, we don't need pasta sauce anymore, and we don't need uh, spaghetti anymore. Um, we are still in need of breakfast foods like um, instant oatmeal and cereal. Um, we have more jelly than peanut butter right now, so if you want to bring some peanut butter to even us out. They're always very hard to keep even. Um, and if you wanted to purchase something perishable, we uh, are collecting hot dogs are one of the things we'd like to get out this month. Hello. So if you'd like to bring a pack of hot dogs, um, that's welcome too. Um, for this weekend, the 16th, this coming Saturday, uh, the Salem County Women for Christ are meeting at um, Sharp, Town. Sharp Town. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad I have friends here. Sharptown United Methodist at 10 a.m. The men are not meeting, um, but Trinity Methodist is holding a men's breakfast on Good Friday. Oh, wow. Uh, thank you for that. Jane wow. just said that Joe, Jane's on with us. Hi, Jane. Uh, Jane said that Joe Ritchie's asking for prayers for himself and his cat. So we'll get that in when we get to prayers. Um, so that covers the breakfast. <coughs> For Holy Week? Sorry, did you have a question? Well, when is the men's breakfast? I mean, what time? <clears throat> On Friday? I don't know. You don't know? Okay. Because no, we're not, the, the Salem County Men for Grace breakfast was canceled because oh, Trinity, Trinity had already planned to have a breakfast. Oh, right, okay. And so <clears throat> rather than having breakfast back to back with a bunch of the same people and it would be harder to get everybody out, they decided to just consolidate and hmm. invite everybody to the Good Friday breakfast. But I don't know the time for that, I'm sorry. Well, it's usually about what? Uh, when it's Salem County Men for Christ, they always meet at 8. Oh, okay. But I don't know if Trinity's going to stick to that or not. I would assume so, but I don't know, and I don't want to give you the wrong information. Okay. Trinity used to do the best oyster dinners. Yeah? I've heard good things. They really made good oyster dinners. Better than Elmer. Better than... Okay. <laughs> I'll have to compare. Yeah. Jane said she picked up some dogs for the pantry, so I'm pretending she means puppies to share with us. Jane. Uh, so, Holy Week for this coming week. Uh, on Wednesday, we will not be having our regular Bible study and prayer meeting. So, we will not be having our regular services on Wednesday. Uh, Thursday, we will be having communion at 7 p.m. That's the Holy Thursday communion or Monday Thursday depending on what you grew up saying. <clears throat> Good Friday, we will also be having a service at 7 p.m. On Sunday, Easter Sunday, there are a few different services that will be happening. Um, at 6.15 in the morning, there will be a community sunrise service down at um, Riverview Park. Um, Morky Jill has teens down the hallway if you are interested in that. Um, yeah, well, I think we're going to tag you in, Diane. Thank you. Um, did you have any prayer requests before you go? No. Okay. Just to split down. Yeah. So, Easter Sunday, 6.15 in the morning, community sunrise service at Riverview Park. 
We are having a sunrise service here at church on the front lawn at 7 in the morning. Between the sunrise service and our regular worship time at 11, we're going to have continental breakfast here. So if you would like to come to the sunrise and stay, or if you'd like to come early for worship, we'll be here for that. During that time, we're going to have all the food set up in room 6 for people to eat. And we'll have the sanctuary open with some instrumental hymns playing. So if you wanted to come in here and have some prayer time before the service, um, you know, the altar, of course, will be open, or you could come and sit and listen to the music and pray. So both of those options will be available during the two, between the two services. And then we'll be having worship at 11 with two baptisms, which I am very excited about. Um, yeah, I think that's all for Easter. Uh, district Assembly is coming up. Half Million Mobilization is going to be kicking off on May 1st. I have some materials for that if you want to check it out. We don't have enough for everybody, but we have a few packets made up that uh, Jim and Carol printed. And then we also have a sample of what you're going to be getting on May 1st. So those are all um, options. Um, let's see. Registration for Teen Camp is open, if you are interested in that. And um, we want to let everybody know. Hello, welcome. Hi. Um, registration for Teen Camp is open. If you sign up before June 1st, it's, uh, there's a 10% discount. And we want to let everyone know that we have money set aside to help pay for scholarships. So. Um, if you are a teen or have a teen or know a teen that wants to go and money is a barrier, we want to make sure that we are able to help. So if you have any questions about that, you can see me um, or one of our board members, whoever you're more comfortable talking with, and we'll make sure we get to help you out. We're still coordinating carpooling and rides and all that, and just so everybody knows detail-wise, we are not going to have any counselors from our church there but the counselors will be from other churches on the district. So this is a campus hosted by our district. I have a question about that. So it's hosted by the Philadelphia District Church of the Nazarene, and all of the staff involved are from district churches. Everyone has passed a background check and all that kind of stuff too. So if you have any more questions about those kinds of details, please let me know. We're happy to answer any questions we can or ask if we don't know the answer. All right? Okay. A um, couple birthdays this week. Tomorrow is Norma's birthday. Um, and then the 17th is Daryl's birthday. So. Um, I'm going to pretend I didn't hear that, but I'm glad I heard that. When did that happen? <laughs> I know. I was telling Adelaide, I said, I never thought I'd be married to a 60 year old man. <laughs> Me neither. <laughs> <laughs> we all get old, don't we? <laughs> yeah. He's not here, I can do that. <laughs> <laughs> Listen, if he got confused for 60 to that, I think he'd be happy. Um, well, why don't we start by mentioning, we'll, we'll keep praying for Daryl. He's not feeling well today. Um, is there anything specific you want to share, or just let's pray for him because he's not feeling well? Let's not feeling So please pray for Daryl. I'm sure he was very disappointed to not be able to make it to church this morning. So, But we understand. I told everyone in church that Pink had a flamingo flu. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but uh, we will certainly keep praying for Daryl. And Jane asked, um, she said that she spoke with Joe Ritchie. And he asked for prayer for himself and his cat. Would, would anyone else have a uh, prayer request you'd like to share with the group? Pray for Jim. <clears throat> and continue for Patty. <clears throat> and unspoken. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, Jim found out this afternoon that David Sorrels did come home from the hospital. Yeah. So he had triple bypass last week. 
Um, the last update he had, we, that I have, he had gone from ICU to a regular room, but he, Jim found out he came home. Yeah. So amen for that. Mm -hmm. So we're going to pray for David's continued um, recovery. Yeah. But Jim was amazed by that because he was in the hospital for quite a while, and then he went to rehab. Yeah, rehab. yeah. Yeah, it's really amazing. One like what Mark went through with his surgery too, to be back without restrictions so fast. I mean, I know he's on the young side and pretty fit, but it's still amazing. When you think of what it was like 20 years ago. You know. Well, it was just in 2018 when Jim had his. That's okay, yeah. Well, uh, let's see who else is on here. My mom is on here. Hi, Mom. I have to say hi to my mom. I can <laughs> uh, since my mom is on here, that reminds me, she has a prayer request that she shared with us. Uh, her friend Marion had uh, several strokes and is in the hospital. So please pray for her recovery. She's in that window where she is recovering some, and they're hoping to get as much recovery as fast as possible, because I guess there's kind of a time limit on that. So please pray for Marion and her family as they care for her. Um, we also had an update. We've been praying for my niece. Let me finish writing this. Um, she was cleared by the doctor. He said that her hand has um, is healing very well. She's not fully cleared, but she's allowed to start some of her gymnastics again. So that was a big deal for her. Uh, she's also allowed to drive, which was a really big deal because she yeah, she you. broke her hand the, just less than a week after she got her license. <laughs> so she only got to drive herself to school a few times before she broke her hand. So um, I have a friend that needs prayer for both her hands. Okay. Well, we think God knows who we're talking about. Yes, He does. He certainly does. <clears throat> um, would anyone else like to share a prayer request? I still have my list. But, hmm. um, one from uh, I wanted to share a couple from Sunday school. Um, we want to keep praying for the Smick family. Mr. Smick's funeral was this past was was yesterday. Um, it was uh, quite the full house. Uh, if you have a moment to look at his obituary, he really was involved in a lot in the community. Um, I read it. Boy like Scouts and Rotary and <coughs> mission groups to Dominican Republic and all kinds of things. Mm -hmm. um, so we, uh, of course, are, are sad that he's not with us on this earth, but we celebrate a life well lived. And uh, he certainly lived life fully. Here are the most recent. Sorry. <laughs> Sometimes we hit buttons. I got to. Um, yeah. So the Smick family, and then the Petersons have asked us to keep praying for their friend who is in Cooper. Um, he is still on a vent and has a trach. They are now looking to possibly transferring him to a long-term care facility, which. Is, is it's good that he's stable, but they they were hoping for more progress before he was discharged. They were hoping he'd be able to get off the ventilator at least. So as long as he's on that vent, um, he doesn't have a lot of uh, ability to resume any kind of activities. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, my grandchildren are either Italy or France. <laughs> Okay. It was the boat, but I don't know which one was first. Right. Well, no Paris. No. no. <laughs> I'm a good grandmother. Ralph has been moved to a permanent room. Yeah, no Paris. So he's up on the front half now. Not far from where he was, but yeah, up closer to the front door. He's into one of the permanent resident rooms. 
I haven't either. The last I saw him, he was still in the transition. Yeah. Healthy. So that probably just happened. That must have just happened this week, right? Yeah. Okay. All right. Um, Pray for Ralphie, too. He's very depressed about him. an update. His neighbor Wayne is uh, recovering well after his surgery for cancer. Um, it's going to be a little while before they do a scan to check and see uh, how things are progressing, but as far as the surgery itself, he's doing very well, so that's a great update. Um, anything else that anyone would like to share? I will say, I had a wonderful time marching in the palms this morning <laughs> with the little cute. kids. And um, it puts things in perspective when you can celebrate a day like Palm Sunday with little kids. Um, so I just, it was a special moment for me, and I was very, uh, I feel very privileged to get to do things. It's a wonderful day. And when we were, you guys might not have been able to see because we were sitting down on the floor, but when I mentioned the phrase from Psalm 139 about God's hand of blessing, Cody looked over to Junior and put his hand on his head and smiled. Oh. <laughs> and I thought, oh, that is so adorable, my heart's going to burst. <laughs> so that was uh, just a wonderful phrase that I, I wanted to share. And if you want to come and join us on the floor next time, you know, you get to see this stuff up close. It's fine. Somebody will have to get me up. Yeah, well, Diane sat in the front row, and I, I you like know what, can. that's not a bad compromise, so. <laughs> good stuff, yeah. All right, anything else before we go to prayer? All right, let's pray together. Father God, thank you for this day. Thank you for another chance to gather together, and Father, thank you for what we're celebrating today, Palm Sunday. Thank you, Father, for, for loving us enough to send your Son. And we thank Jesus for his love for us, his sacrifice, and the gift of life that he offers us. A light in the darkness, Father. Thank you. Thank you for sending the light into our darkness. Father, we lift up our brothers and sisters to you tonight. Mm -hmm. We lift up our brother Daryl to you, Father. Yes. We pray that you would touch his body, that you would bring healing, and, and um, that you'd, you'd help you know, his doctors know what's going on, and that you would help him to be well. Father, we especially pray that he would be covered, recovered well enough for them to go down and visit Annalise later this week. We lift up Joe and his cat to you, Father. We know that Joe has had a very hard year after losing Jean. And Father, we pray for your grace and peace and love to wash over him, that he would feel your love and your presence right now. Father, we lift up Jim to you. Um, we know it takes a lot to keep him out of church. And uh, we thank you. He was well enough to come this morning, and we pray that you will Help him to recover fully, Father, so we can celebrate all of our Holy Week services together with him. Yes. We lift up Patty to you, Father. We pray that you would continue to be with her in her health journey. We pray that you would restore function to her lungs, help her to be able to breathe and move. We lift up several other friends in our circle, Father, who are dealing with some long-term health issues. We remember both Mike's and we remember Rini. Father, we remember Malcolm and Buddy and Dale. Um, Father, we, we remember David Sorrells. We thank you for the wonderful news that he is home yes. and doing so much better after his triple bypass. Yes. 
Father, thank you for the gift of medicine, and thank you especially that we live in a place where we have access to this kind of medicine. Um, we really are blessed, Father, and I want to say thank you for that. We lift up Mary and Weimer to you, Father. We pray that you would help her to recover um, her lost function from her strokes, and we pray that you would be with her family as well as they care for her. We thank you for the good news from Lauren's doctor's appointment this week. Father, we thank you that her broken hand is healing well. And uh, again, thank you for access to medical care and for help. We know that in other places and other times, that break would have been debilitating. But thank you very much, Father, for your care and for her healing. Father, we lift up Kay's friend who's dealing with trouble with her hands. We pray that you would bring healing and restoration. We know that that is one of those troubles that can really make quality of life go down yeah. when we can't use our hands and when we have chronic pain. And so, Father, I pray that you would bring healing to this situation. We lift up Kay's grandchildren who are abroad. We pray that they would enjoy their trip, but also that they'd make it uh, back safely, that they wouldn't have to deal with any of the troubles that are going on in the world right now. Mm -hmm. We also lift up uh, Daryl and Charlene's upcoming trip, Father, we pray that Daryl would be well enough to travel and that they would be able to celebrate Easter with Annalise. Father, we lift up Ralph to you. Um, we thank you for the kind people you've put in his circle to love him and care for him over... Um, yeah, Father, we pray for Ralph, Father. We pray not just for his body, um, but for his heart, for his soul, for his spirit. And we pray for his children and the rest of his family, especially his son Ralphie. Father, we pray that you would touch Ralphie's heart and bring some light into his darkness right now. Uh, Father, we thank you for other good news. We thank you for um, Wayne's report that he's doing better. Um, we thank you that the Peterson's friend is stable and Father, we pray that he would be able to come off of the ventilator so that he would be able to come home and be with his family. Father, we lift up the situation in Ukraine. Um, we're seeing more and more horrible stories in the news. And Father, while we don't entirely know what's happening or why it's happening, we pray for an end to this violence. We pray that there would be peace talks that there would be a ceasefire, and that there could be an end to this fighting. Father, we lift up so many who have lost loved ones. We know that many people who are fighting in this conflict on both sides did not choose to enter into this conflict. And we know that there are many families who've lost their loved ones, children who've lost their fathers, mm -hmm. parents who've lost their children. Um, and Father, the civilian toll has been so high We pray that the refugees that have been able to make it out would find safety, that they would find care and love. Father, I pray that this could be a moment when your people could rise up and show our love to give water to those who are thirsty and food to those who are hungry, to care for those in need. Father, please be with us tonight and this week as we finish the Sermon on the Mount and as we go into our Holy Week services. Father, I pray that this would be a time where we are open to you, where we are open to your encouragement, where we are open to your correction, and where we receive the hope and life that you offer. Father, thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Okay, so next on our list, we're working through our list tonight, is um, our Lent devotion. Um, would anyone have something from the Lent devotion you might like to share? Maybe something you read this week that you felt was um, touching or effective? I'm going to take one moment and do attendance because I forgot before we started. We had a very interesting discussion today in Sunday school about Friday's devotion. 
uh, the house built on the sand versus the house built on the stone. And there was a discussion question we actually didn't get to. That was at, at, the, at the end of that. And the question was, um, well, let me just turn and read it directly. Uh, the question was this, and it was under the, the discipline and response section. This is at the bottom of page 95. Are you building on the rock that is not only faith in Jesus, but also daily life lived in his name and after his pattern? What goals could you set that would help you to strengthen the foundation of your Christian life? So I wanted to ask that question to you guys tonight for discussion. Um, well, well, two questions. Um, are you building your life on Christ? And what goals could you set? Um, I think that ties in with this being the end of the Lenten journey. Did you learn anything during Lent? Maybe God revealed a new practice you should take up. Maybe God revealed something you should lay down or stop. Maybe God encouraged you to change your daily office, your time with him. What do you guys think? What was Lent like for you this year? <clears throat> I've read it a lot more. Um, yeah. And uh, Jim and I have prayed together more. That is a blessing. Yes. Mm. And the more that you read, the more you learn. Amen. And it doesn't matter if you've read it before or not. Right. That formation is deeper each time. Thank you for sharing. Would someone else like a chance to share? Yesterday at the funeral, we got, we got the, or to, or we were you know, listening to the whole funeral, I mean the service. And um, one of the things they, the pastor was talking about was on the back of the prayer card or whatever the, Situated card, it has his, uh, his verse. Um, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. And um, so I, I got to thinking, I mean, there's a lot of verses, different ones that, oh, I like that one. Or I've never, I don't think I've ever adopted, like, okay, this is my life verse. So I've been thinking about that. And huh. every once in a while, me and Daryl, I'd be like, how about this one, Daryl? And I'll, I'll think of one, but I haven't come to the one I. Do you have any on your short list that you'd want to share? Um, no, because, I mean, like, Annalise is favorite. I can tell you what hers is, is Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. That's her, her favorite one. We're twinsies. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so I, I don't, I'm not certain yet. <laughs> I'm, I mean, I think that has to be really thought through because it's important. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so... I haven't come to that one yet. But then the other thing is, you were mentioning how many things, different things he was involved in and how, you know, I'm sure there's probably a lot of things that we don't know that he did behind the scenes and stuff. Mm -hmm. But, um, I, you know, you, you think about that when you're at a funeral. Like, what would I want said at my funeral? Do I want people to say, you know, you know just, just think about those things. And that kind of reflects to this. I mean, if, especially if you want to be known as a, a Christian, you want those works that, you know, did I show Christ to these people? Did I, you know, I don't know. Fear will make you think. <laughs> yeah. I was reading a devotion on the parable of the sheep and the goats during that. It's one I get over email. And they brought up something interesting. You know, in that parable, it's when Jesus turns to the people on his right and says, when I was thirsty, you gave me a drink. You know? And then he turns to the people on the other side and says, when I was thirsty, you did not help me. Short paraphrase, but one of the things that the the author said was that both people seemed surprised. You know, um, the people who had helped Jesus seemed surprised. I, you know, I was just helping people. I didn't know I was showing love to God. And then the people on the other side were surprised that they weren't going to be included in the kingdom. When did we ever see you thirsty and not help you? Uh, that was an interesting, I, I di it didn't really bring me to a conclusion, but it kind of pickled my brain a little bit, you know, to 
to think about that. You know, if, if I were to stand in that place, <coughs> which we all will someday, what's that conversation going to be like? There's a there's a joke I heard a long time ago. You know, you should live so that the pastor doesn't have to lie at your funeral, right? Um, <laughs> or another one I like: live your life so that the pastor can inherit your parrot after you die. <laughs> um, but you know, going through Revelation, there there are books that contain you know what we've done with our lives, and we're gonna sit with Jesus someday and look through those books. And I don't want to be ashamed of that experience. You know? I've often thought about the animal sacrifice. I don't know how that would go over today with your Peter people and that. <laughs> but, you know, I often thought about it and it dawned on me that this animal has got to die because I sinned. You know, I thought the animal dies because we sin without the shedding of blood, and then the scapegoat, you know, that that kind of the lamb, we, we say the lamb that was slain, but then the goat gets to go free mm -hmm. and escape it. Yeah, just so everybody understands, and again, this is a brief overview. On the Day of Atonement each year, there was a lamb that was sacrificed on behalf of the people. There were other sacrifices too, but you have a lamb that was sacrificed on behalf of the whole nation, but also you have another sacrifice, the scapegoat, that bore the sins of the people and was cast out into the wilderness outside of the city. So um, we see both of those aspects in Christ, that he was the perfect lamb whose blood was shed for us, but also that he was cast out and executed in Golgotha outside of the city. There, there are more layers there, but that's kind of the overview, just so we all are on the same page. That Jesus fulfills those needs perfectly. The same scripture was during Tuesday night study with the women, too. Oh, yeah? Yeah. Wonderful. I'm going to have to join women's Bible study. I think that's <laughs> the only conclusion. I really think so, too. I have two invitations. I think that counts as enough, right? Just zoom in and say you're chill. Just keep your camera off. Keep the camera off. Yeah. I'll just hold a picture of you. Yeah, Kyle I think there might be now. some problems with that. Yeah, so. that's true. But I'm going to pick up your book, I think. But, um, <coughs> good stuff. Anything anyone else would like to share about your Lenten journey? It's been nice doing it with my husband. Amen. Now, I'm not trying to call you out with this statement. Uh, it applies to you too. Have you ever found that you go through Lent and you start an extra practice, whether it's prayer or devotions or whatever, and you think how good it is when you do it? Then why don't we stop? We need another book and we're going to get one. Like <laughs> <laughs> That's true. That's true. Um, I just want to, did you want to share? No, just that's exactly what I did. It's like I decided I'm going to keep doing these, so I was going to ask you for another any suggestions on what to do after this one ends. Yeah. So, if somebody wants those. something tonight, yeah. I do have some extra copies of previous devotions the church has done. If there's maybe one that you haven't done with the church, several more from Lent or from Advent, but I have some of those. If we can, I got stuff for you. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, that's. if it was so good, we should keep doing it. There's nothing stopping us. Think about, it makes me think of, I can think of a couple moments in my life, uh, some, a couple altar experiences for me that were life changing. And I think sometimes you come off of an emotional experience like that with such a fire. But then sometimes we let that fire dwindle down. You know, and sometimes it's life piling up on us, sometimes it's choices we make, lots of reasons. But how important it is to maintain that fire, to keep it stoked. And I think that's one of the beautiful things about seasons like Lent or Advent, when we're encouraged to have contemplative practices or practice spiritual disciplines, it can expose us to something that maybe we haven't done before. 
um, or maybe just something we haven't done in a long time and remind us that it's important. You know, our, our, our devotions, our daily office, it's, it's like going to the gym. You know, it's nice to have a membership, but if you don't actually go regularly, it's not going to do you any good. Right? So, it's the same as a church. It's nice to have a membership, but if you don't put in the work, you're not going to get the benefit. And I'm not saying we earn our salvation. I'm just saying our relationship with Jesus is only as good as the time we put into it. We're not going to have a, a wonderful, healthy relationship with Jesus if he's not a priority in our life. It, it doesn't happen. Yeah. Um, I wanted to share one thing from today. Um, to, today's devotional passage is actually the same as the sermon passage. From Matthew 21, 1 to 11, the, the Palm Sunday narrative. And um, I just wanted to share this part of is what I was thinking about when I wrote the sermon this week. But on page 100, it's the last, the end, end of the last paragraph under the consider section. But when we celebrate the victory of Jesus, will we really know what we are cheering about? Will we just be joining the crowd and getting caught up in the emotion of it all? Or will we be able to celebrate with tears of joy because we have been to Golgotha and realized that he died there for the love of you and me? I know that we can take different things away from these passages and maybe you took something different than I did from this. But for me, this encouraged me to take time in prayer and meditation on what we're actually celebrating. To not just go through the nuts and bolts of, well, we're going to have communion on Thursday, and we're going to dim the lights on Friday, and Saturday we're going to get up early and maybe there's going to be donuts. You know, it, we've got the patterns, right? And the same thing can happen at Advent, where we have our, our kind of mile markers of the things that we do during that season checking off the boxes, but it's important for us to have our heart in the right place. To not just come and celebrate because it's a fun spring day and we're excited. You know. And I, I don't mean that to be a damper. That's also part of what I was thinking about this morning as we were marching with the kids. Um, it's fun to march around with little kids. <laughs> you know? yeah. And that could be just an emotional moment. Uh, it's just fun to be excited with little kids because of the energy they bring. We have to remember why we're doing it, too. Right? Crying Hosanna. Save us. Hosanna. Yeah. Is there anything else anybody would like to mention from the Lent devotion? Now, there is some bonus material here. We've got um, readings that go um, through... through um, Easter. They're a little bit shorter for Holy Week, but there are, there are continued readings outside of the Sermon on the Mount. So we've got to, we might be mentioning this again. I'm not sure we'll be mentioning this during the Holy Thursday service, but um, there is more material in here. Oh, I'm sorry, I missed this. Ivelisse got on with us. Hello, Ivelisse. Um, she asked us to pray for her husband, Cisco, that he is waiting for test results from a study he had on Friday. So thank you for sharing that, Ivelisse, and we'll pray again at the end here. Please tell Cisco we're praying for him. Okay. Uh, anything else before we move back into our study? All right. Now, we set the bar pretty high last week with how much material we covered, so we're going to see if we can double that this week. <laughs> I got several teasing, loving messages about the fact that we only covered five verses last week. Uh, I'll remind, I, I'm going to say, and this was the best way I could describe it, John 1, 1 through 5 is, is not a potato chip. It is like a fudge casserole, <laughs> right? It's rich, and you can't just gobble it down. You've got to take your time <laughs> and go through this. So... Um, we, uh, we're going to continue our journey in the Gospel of John. Um, 
as I mentioned, we made it up through verse 5 last week. Would anyone have any questions or comments or maybe any thoughts you might have had after we finished last week about 1 through 5? He is, was, and always is. Amen. All right, well then let's continue. We're going to pick up at verse 6. We're in the Gospel of John, chapter 1. And uh, do we have a volunteer who would read verses 6 through 9? We're going to start talking about John the Baptist today. Well, now. <laughs> We're going to make Carol do it? Okay. God sent a man, John the Baptist, to tell about the light so that everyone might believe because of his testimony. John himself was not the light. He was simply a witness to tell about the light. The one who is the true light, who gives light to everyone, was coming into the world. Thank you very much. Now, let's get one little detail clear. There are multiple Johns in the Bible. And what was that? This one's not the best. Right. Well, the one who wrote the Gospel of John, no, is yeah. not John the Baptist. But we are going to be talking about John the Baptist. So if it's got the Baptist after it, that's one guy. And if it's the disciple who Jesus loved, that's a different guy. Okay? So we're going to try to keep our John straight. There's also John Mark, but he gets a nickname, so we you know, don't mix him up. Um, and I'm sure there are other many other Johns we could talk about. But... Um, we are introducing John the Baptist. Now, in Matthew and Luke, we get a little bit more detail about him. So I'm going to ask any of you who might be familiar with um, the stories in Matthew or Luke, um, what do we know about John the Baptist? Who is he? Who's his family? His cousin. It's Jesus' cousin. Yes, Jesus' cousin. <coughs> and his mother was old, but he was born. His mother was old when he was born. Yes, he was a surprise baby, a blessing. Dad couldn't speak during pregnancy. That's true. That's true. He was filled with the Holy Spirit from birth. Amen. He also lived in the desert and ate locusts and wild honey. Yes, and wore camel hair. Yeah. Yeah, Or camel skin. Camel hair, camel skin. Skin, I think. He didn't have a fancy brown jacket. (laughs) I made one of those. Yeah? Not what happened. It should be a church somewhere. Hmm. Out of real camel. Huh? Out of a real camel, camel. she said? (laughs) (laughs) But John John the Fever was John the Baptist. Yeah. So I just want to mention a historical detail. We've touched on this a little bit before, but um, John the Baptist was a prophet. Does anybody know how long it had been between John and the most recent prophet? Four to six hundred years. Yeah. Yeah. Hundreds of years. So the gap between Malachi and John the Baptist <coughs> is over 400 years. Yeah. So that's a long time to go without a prophet, right? So you might understand why when John the Baptist shows up and starts speaking like a prophet out in the wilderness and baptizing people, this gets some attention, right? This gets some attention. So John the Baptist is in, in, oh yes, Evely said 400 years. There's a delay, so we'll give you double credit with Kay for the answer. (laughs) Um, Sorry. Let's look here, just in these few verses, what is said about John. We haven't gotten to John speaking yet, but um, first of all, why is John doing what he's doing? Where does his ministry come from? Probably deep in his soul because he left in his mother's womb when he was close to Mary. Carrying well, that's Jesus. true. He's he's been, you know, spiritually sensitive since before he was born. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Look at the beginning of verse six. Who sent John? God. God. Yeah. So this is important, right? We're recognizing he is the real deal. He's he's not some huckster trying to trick everybody. He was sent from God. But when you have somebody sent from God, there can be confusion, right? Because just like we're confusing our Johns, 
You know, they didn't really know who the Messiah was yet. And when they start seeing amazing things happen by people who are sent from God, it can be easy to, to muddy the waters a little bit, right? So something very specific is said about John. Um, what does it say in verse 7? He came as a witness. Exactly. And then it, verse 8 follows that up by saying... He was not himself the light. Right. So he came to be a witness to the, to the Messiah, or to the light, but he is not the Savior himself. And we'll see this later on. I'm not the one, there's one coming after me, right? You know. Did he and Jesus grow up together because they were cousins? I have thought about this a lot. <laughs> and the shortest answer I have is we don't know for sure. Okay. Um, because of family structures, some people assume that they did. Mary had to travel a little bit to visit Elizabeth. Um, so, and you know, travel wasn't very easy then. So we don't really know. Because of the family connection, it's possible. Because of the distance, maybe they didn't. So, yeah, my short answer is I don't know. Would you have anything to answer that question, Pastor? Well, just the, just the actions of Jesus and John when, uh, as they met as, as adults, kind of indicates that, uh, to me, that he wasn't all that familiar with Jesus. It wasn't buddy-buddy. Uh, uh, you know, he had, it was less along the lines of relative, more along the lines of Savior. Uh, and uh, so, you know, uh, he had to look. He, he wasn't hanging out with John, I, I, I don't think. I think they were relatives, but they were raised at, in, in two different worlds. And certainly John, it indicates that John just kind of went out to the desert yeah. and li lived there for a time and was prophesied where Jesus was in Nazareth, uh, you know, working with his father and then doing the family business. They, they meet in Jerusalem doing this Passover, this feast. Yeah, I don't. I, I really think that there's the, there's more stronger indications that uh, John spent uh, more time maybe with uh, uh, recluses like the Essenes or others out in the desert. He was. You may have had a prof, uh, prophetic school out there. Um, so he was. He's kind of um, one of those who didn't come into Jerusalem all that much. Yeah. It's, I think it's safe to assume they would have known of each other. Because, you know, Mary and Elizabeth were close enough. I'm sure their names were mentioned. But I, I kind of lean with what you're saying, Pastor, that the way they respond to each other in the Gospels, they don't seem like close friends. But, like I said, the short and safe answer is we don't know. <laughs> Um, yeah, they would have been some interesting child evangelists together, but, but yeah, we don't know for sure. So, John was not the light himself, but he was a witness to the light, and we're, we're kind of told that at this point in the story, the, the ministry of Jesus and the revelation of who he is has, has not been shared with everybody. So, when we read this, sometimes time and distance get mushed together when we read the Gospels. You know, we read one chapter, then the next chapter, and think of everything just happening. But, as Pastor Tom said, there's a geographic separation. Jesus was living in Nazareth area um, in, the, in the north, and John was preaching in the desert outside of Jerusalem, which was down in the south. And there was a a not easy journey in between the two. There's a, a chunk of land kind of cut out of the middle that was Samaria. And it wasn't really easy to tr for Jewish people, it wasn't really easy or safe for Jewish people to travel back and forth through Samaria. So to get from Nazareth down to Jerusalem, you had to kind of hook around to take the safe route. And it was a long journey and a hard journey. So um, we also have to consider time. We know that Jesus was about 30 when he began his public ministry, 
We don't really know how long John was preaching out in the desert before we get to this point. Um, he could have been out there preaching for many years before it built up to this level of exposure. We just we really don't know. So just, we have to keep in mind what we do know and what we don't know. You'll see that at this point in the Gospel of John, we're, we're much more concerned with the big picture and putting the blocks in place than we are the specifics of who said what and when. And we'll get into that more as we go. But right now, remember in verses 1 through 5, we went all the way back to before creation. So we, we just covered thousands and thousands, you know, thousands of years in five verses. Okay, um, okay so we covered the light, coming into the world. Okay. Um, Let's keep going here. Let's read verses 10 through 13, which tells us more about the light. Would somebody read verses 10 through 13 for us, please? Yeah, I'll do it. Thank you, Kay. He was in the world, and though the world was made through him, the world did not recognize him. He came to that which was his own, but his own did not receive him. Yet to all who received him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become the children of God, children who were not of natural descent, nor of human decision, or a husband's will, but born of God. Thank you. So we have some more deep statements here. Mm. So let's kind of unpack them a little bit at a time. Um, the beginning of verse 10 we kind of covered, right? What, what do we know about Jesus in the first half of verse 10? Created the world. And he came into the world that he created. Okay. So we're touching on that idea again that Jesus is creator, not created. Right? That Jesus is co-eternal. So we're going to keep touching on Jesus' divinity as we go through the Gospel of John. He came into the world that he created, but what happened when he got here? He didn't recognize him. Did not recognize him. <laughs> I, I want to take that and go back to the previous uh, uh, groups of verses here. Sure. That um, they, they didn't. The world didn't recognize him. Um, there's a phenomenon that that is, you know, constantly present present today. That that I think we need to be aware of very strongly. That. Um, you know, John was a witness uh, to the true light, to that light, and it identifies the true light that gives light to everything. Uh, why do we need a witness of light? Uh, you turn off the, you tur turn off the uh, the the lights, uh, the electric lights, and particularly if it's night out, it's rather dark in our houses and. If you light a candle, you can see it. You don't, you don't need a witness to it. It's there. It's just you know, there. Well, I think that that's part of what we need to understand, that there's a lot of false light. There's, there's a lot of false lights out there. Um, and uh, we're, we're confronting that uh, to, from uh, throughout the history of the world. But, we're also, but it, the Bible indicates if we're going to be confronted with that more and more and more until the Antichrist is there and the former the former angel of light, Lucifer, is is the is trying to pose as the light. And and we're we're confronted with that. Um, John is throwing this witness out. And and Jesus is that light, and yet they don't recognize him. They don't. If it, it's so dark, their their eyes are so blinded. Uh, the world's eyes are so blinded, they cannot even see the light in a deep darkness. And uh, that those are, I think, those are things that we we need to remember, because um, we need to be concerned about their darkness. 
and, and have pity on them and bring them to, to the light like John was trying to do. But we also need to call them up like John is going to do and like Jesus is going to do. And we need to recognize there's competing lights and but there's only one true light. There's just, there's a, just a number of these things that we need to pull from this, I, I do believe. Mm. Yeah, and we're, we're going to continue to explore these themes. Remember, we're, we're only partway through the first chapter. Um, we mentioned the, the concept of heresy last week, and I think that's a very important point. When, when John, when this gospel was written, or when John the Baptist was preaching, we're not just talking about bringing information to people who are ignorant, right? You're not just teaching someone who hasn't learned yet. We're correcting falsehood. And even after the gospel, even after the, the life and resurrection of Jesus, as this gospel was written later on, as the church was beginning to form, there were a lot of people who tried to take advantage of that. So this light and darkness theme, to touch on what you brought up, you know, darkness, we're not talking about it from a science standpoint, where darkness is just the absence of light. In this case, light is the presence of love and goodness in God. Darkness is also the presence of evil. It's not just empty. There's presence there. So, yeah, we're, we're dealing with both these layers. You covered a lot there. You know, you, you kind of referenced the, the Antichrist issue as well. And that's, you know, one of the, the scary things about the book of Revelation is as the Antichrist rises, there are going to be a lot of people who believe that he's the Messiah. And you know, you think, well, how could they, how could they be fooled? Well, first of all, let's just make a point. <coughs> this gospel was written so that people would have written truth to compare against. They did, before this was written, they didn't have that. So the time when these gospels were written, there's a lot. It's kind of like a wild, wild west there, where lots of people are claiming lots of things. And it was important that people like John, who had a direct connection to Jesus, could correct the narrative. Very, very important. Uh, to to build, uh, build on that, please. Uh, there are numerous uh, antichrists that, uh, you know, the spirit of antichrist, that without being the antichrist, that, that we, we may point to at various times in in the history of the world. One of the more famous ones, Hitler. Um, and uh, the, there, one of the tragedies was that, and uh, I, I encountered a little bit of this um, in my first year in, at Mount Vernon, Nazarene College, I went, I went home, um, uh, uh, went, uh, not home, but went with a team, a team ministry team to uh, uh, one of our uh, fellow college students uh, she took us to her church and we, we resided in her home and we, we sang but we had we had uh, Sunday dinner at their table and with uh, but her grandmother was there and uh, her dad was Mexican and her and her, and her mother was uh, the uh, the daughter of this German immigrant and this German German grandmother, uh, she this this gal told me that she still had some warm feelings for Hitler, and because of the good things he did, and um, and so it was it was really hard for her uh, to, to know that he did some other bad things. Um, the the churches in the thirties in America, uh, uh, conservative churches, some, some of them s supported Hitler in his early years because, they, and, and such. We even had a Supreme Court rule and they supported some of his early, you know, pushes towards sterilizing criminals. Yeah, and, and there's, and then today, um, we have friends uh, whose children are in Russia, working for the Orth Russian Orthodox Church, and uh, they love Putin. 
and uh, they're they're blinded to the, uh, the the bad things that he is doing, and he is as in, he is saying enough things and uh, being supportive of the Orthodox Church so that he is uh, deceiving even them, and his course, their parents are just heartbroken over that. You may have heard last week he had a rally in a stadium and he quoted scripture and prayed during that rally in support of what he's doing. So th th these are examples of competing lights uh, that, uh, and an example of how the Antichrist will deceive even the elect. Mm. They have shut off all outside media too. Hasn't he? Yeah, he's, he's done well to, to, to try to... But I'll tell you, they still have the Bible. <coughs> so we, when you get a, a politician misquoting scripture, yeah. and this is kind of where I was starting to go, we can look at people then and say, oh, those silly people who were tricked. We don't have the excuses they have. We have God's word. And we have plenty of opportunities like this to gather together and study and learn. So we, we don't have an excuse to be deceived. We should know. We should be prepared. When people claim to be from God and live ways that are not godly, we should be able to recognize the difference. We covered this in our Lent devotion a few days ago, but the, the, where Jesus says you'll know a tree by its fruit, that a good tree, good tree cannot produce bad fruit, and a bad tree cannot produce good fruit. You know, this is one of those ideas. You know, and, and people, whether it's Vladimir Putin or or the Nazi Party and Hitler, With people the prey on weakness. People prey on pain, right? And and often people make promises. I can fix what's wrong. Mm -hmm. You know, they're the reason you're hurting, and I can fix it. And if you just listen to me and do what I say. Right? Um, that kind of geopolitical situation is not that different from where the church was going in this day. If you read the epistles of John, you'll, you'll hear some of this correction of heresy as well. But they were moving to further and further into a period where they were horribly oppressed and persecuted by the Roman Empire, right? where, where Christians were executed for entertainment fed to animals in the Colosseum, all kinds of things, right? Even in the period when the New Testament was written, we hear about Priscilla and Aquila being cast out of Rome when all the Jewish people were kicked out of the city of Rome. You're not allowed to live here if you're Jewish. Um, and so when we combine some of the Johannine literature, the Gospel of John and the Book of Revelation, we're talking to a church that's moving into a period where there will be more persecution. And that persecution makes people vulnerable to false teachers. Because right? when you're hurting, you'll follow whoever says they can stop the hurt. Right? And that, those kinds of seasons, when things are hard, is when people get really, really vulnerable to these false promises or false lights. And you know, we'll, we'll get into this more as we go through. But you, know, you have the capital A Antichrist, like Satan. But then you have lowercase a Antichrist, or people who are against Jesus and false teachers. And we've really got to be careful of that. Um, e even just in our day, it's, it's becoming, well, not just accepted, but popular to, to, to say that Jesus was a good man, but not the Son of God. You know, there are many people who recognize that the Bible is around and there are good things to be learned from the Bible, but separate that from the divinity of Christ and, and you know, the theology of what we believe. But how can you say that? How can you say, I believe this person and not believe what they said? And that's a big part of why we have this written down, so that we can keep those truths straight. So something like what John has addressed multiple times already, just in the first half of this chapter, that Jesus was not a created being. Right? That Jesus is co-eternal with the Father. This is a really, really important issue because our whole concept of Easter, of being saved, it's built on this idea of, of who Jesus is. 
And if Jesus isn't who he says he is, we're hopeless. Paul says that in, in uh, 2 Corinthians, right? If the resurrection isn't true, then we have no hope. There's, there is nothing. Everything falls apart. So I think that's why the Gospel of John starts the way it does. It is starting by building that firm foundation, right? We've got to start off our story about Jesus by understanding he is God. Because if he's not God, he was just a nice guy. And there have been lots of nice guys. And lots of nice guys have been killed by governments. But this is something special and different. And I think that's part of why we have the prophet John the Baptist, right? To prepare that. To affirm and to, to seek that knowledge. Um, we're going to get into it in a little bit. And obviously we're not going to get through all of it tonight. But, you know, prophecy from Isaiah explains that John the Baptist is coming to prepare the way for Jesus. The, the imagery that's used there is to uh, knock down the valley, the mountains and fill in the valleys, right? To uh, make the road level so that the road is prepared. Um, but that was John the Baptist's role, is to start things off. And as we'll get into this, um, some of the 12 disciples had been listening to John the Baptist. And part of the reason they were ready to respond to Jesus when he came is that they had already been listening to John the Baptist. They had already kind of uh, received part of the message. So this is all the pieces coming together. So John is in this transition here um, from, you know, verses 1 through 5 into the rest of chapter 1. We're taking the foundation of who, who Jesus is, our Christology, and then we're bringing that up and connecting it to the historical events of Jesus' life and ministry. And that's a lot, that's a lot of heavy lifting why we're, we're going slow through this. Um, we've got more to talk about just in these three verses. Um, verses 12 and 13 introduce a very important idea. Okay? If you're Jewish, how, did you, how does a person become Jewish back then? Uh, birth. Right. Birth. You had a family lineage. They, they maintained birth records. You know, like Paul says, well, I'm of the tribe of Benjamin. I'm the Hebrew of Hebrew. Family. You know, that idea of tracing your family lineage was a really big deal. And which tribe you belong to was also very important. Um, it, it affected your status a little bit in, in the community. There were such a thing as proselytes or, or converts to Judaism. But they did not have the same rights as a natural-born Jewish person. Okay. Um, here, John is saying, to all who believes and accepts in Jesus, he gave the right to become children of God. They are reborn, not with a physical birth resulting from human passions or the plans of people, but a birth that comes from God. So if you are a person of John's day reading this, why would that be significant? Because what you just said, the Jewish people were God's people, so if you're not a Jewish person, you're not God's people. And this is saying that everybody's God's people as long as you believe. Amen. Yeah, and they probably went, what? Well. <laughs> Amen. Yeah. yeah. Um, this is not so much about knocking down the privileged status of people who have a birthright to, to one of the, the 12 tribes. It's about opening the door to welcome everybody else. And this is where we introduce another theme that we're going to be touching on over and over again. The idea that some people feel that they're in because of who they're born to, who their parents are. Um, but personal faith, your, your personal relationship with Christ is the important part. So it doesn't matter who your parents are or, or what lineage you can trace on your birth certificate. Um, it's about what's going on between you and God and that that is a, a personal thing. Somebody else's actions or beliefs are not what make you right with God. Right? It's, it's you accepting and believing Jesus. And as we'll get into later, Jesus correctly connects that to also following what he commands, right? It's not just saying, yeah, you're the son of God. It's also doing what he says. That we love him if we obey him. Um, 
So we're setting the groundwork for these future themes as we go through the gospel. Um, this might be something that you and I take for granted because, you know, most of us, or I'd say all of us, we live in a time where the church is evangelistic. You know, that's a, a natural idea for definitely the people in this room, right, where we are trying to share our faith and trying to invite new people in. But that wasn't always the way, you know. Um, even today, Jewish believers, and I'll, I'll say Orthodox Jewish believers, you don't tend to have the kinds of missionary or evangelism kind of drive that we have in the Christian church. So it's a, it's a different way of approaching the world. It's not that there's a limited blessing and we need to keep it for ourselves, or we're special and you're not. It's everyone is invited in to be adopted. Amen to that, because I'm not Jewish. So. Me neither. Yeah, I so know. I am certainly glad that I've been adopted. Certainly glad that I've been adopted, along with our brothers and sisters. Um, any questions about that? No, but you could uh, talk the rest of the night about the beginning of 10. He came into the very world he created. Yeah. <coughs> it does kind of blow, you know, boggle the mind. Yeah. I was talking to Jill about it, and I was like, I get uncomfortable visiting somebody in the hospital I've never met before. Mm -hmm. Jesus became a human, a baby. Yeah. I, I can't. I don't have the mental horsepower to understand that. But man, Jesus in a manger. Wow. Coming into the world he created and being a vulnerable little baby can't speak, can't feed yourself, can't, nothing, completely helpless. Okay. He could have had angels carrying him around. Yeah. Or he could have come in as an adult, as a, as a grown adult. Yeah. yeah. Or he could have come into a privileged position. And all those things are important to understand the heart of Jesus. Yeah, and people, and people would, um, would honor him for that. Exactly. And even when you read about the, yeah. the suffering servant passage in Isaiah, it even says, and no disrespect to Jesus, it said he was nothing special to look at. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Average, you know. So he wasn't a supermodel. He wasn't a billionaire. He wasn't the, a prince. It wasn't like Moses where he was adopted into the palace. Yeah. All important ideas. Yeah. yeah. Well, welcome back, guys. <laughs> Um, I think we'll need to pause there. We'll get back into this idea. Verse 14 touches again on Jesus dwelling among us. So we'll continue in this vein the next time we meet. It will not be next week. Next Sunday is Easter Sunday, and we are not having our evening study on Easter because we're having the extra sunrise service. We're not going to have our evening lab study. So it will be two weeks when we gather again to pick up in John. And so let's, I'll give you the homework. Read John 1.14 and pray about it. Um, I, I think you're wise in what you say, Carol. Any one of these verses we could spend years thinking about the implications. Now, I don't think we want to spend 20 years going through John. At least you don't want me teaching you for 20 years about John. Um, so we're trying to find that balance, right, where we're, digging into the truth as much as we can here in this context, but also understanding that we're not going to go down every bunny trail. Just a lot of them. But I'd like no. to still be alive when you finish, John. Yeah? Yeah. <laughs> Maybe John the Baptist will teach us the rest of heaven. I don't know. <laughs> but isn't... I'm just going to maybe end that with a thank you. Isn't it a blessing that we have this? Yes. Can you imagine how hard it was to try to follow Jesus at the time before these Gospels were written? You had people traveling from town to town saying, Jesus said this, and somebody else saying, no, Jesus said that. And how would you know? It would be really hard. Right? Yeah. Um, so we really, 
I cannot stress enough how privileged we are to have the Bible, and especially in our society where we are today, you know, I can pull out my cell phone and have, you know, a hundred different translations. We can look at commentaries, we can read sermons, we can do our devotions, you know. I mean, that thing's got two Bibles in one Bible, right? There's two Bibles in the Bible. It's a parallel version, different yeah. translations. But <coughs> same Bible. Sorry, let me be clear there. I'm not a Mormon. But, um, this is a blessing, right? And can, yeah. this, is, this is my last point, I promise, for tonight. If we don't read this, if we don't learn this, that's disrespectful to God. God through went, a lot, went through a lot of work and a lot of people suffered and died so that we could have this book. And if we don't read it and we don't understand it, we're going to be susceptible to following the false lights, to following the antichrists. Right? There are going to be people in the end times who follow the antichrist thinking he's Jesus because they didn't read their Bibles. I bet there are going to be a bunch of people who follow the Antichrist who have dusty Bibles sitting on their bookshelves. With spoons in them. With spoons in them. <laughs> exactly. So, whether it's one verse a week, whether it's five chapters a day, the pace isn't important. The, the, the importance is spending time in God's Word every single day. I want to really strongly encourage you to do that. Um, if you need help, if you need a Bible, we've got them. If you want reading plans, I've got them in my office on the shelf. If you want some devotional books, we've got some of those too. Um, we want to do everything we can to help you dig into God's Word. It can't just be what happens here at church. We need to spend time in God's Word every day. And it doesn't have to be any, you know, I have a friend who isn't so good with reading. And so he uses a Bible app to play scripture out loud to him. You know, it used to be that you had to get the Bible on cassette. Anybody had, any, my grandmother had the big binders full of cassettes, and it was like five or six big binders to get through the Bible. Yeah, I gave that to my stepmother. Yeah, and I mean, hey, that's amazing. And then it went to CD, it got smaller. Now you can just hit the app on your phone and hit the little speaker, and it starts reading the Bible to you. Do that. Listening to the Bible is a wonderful way to learn it, too. Um, if you are more of a visual person, check out The Bible Project, um, thebibleproject.com. They have a lot of videos that explain scripture. That's, a, that's one of the podcasts I've been getting into. So, lots of different options, but spend time in God's Word every day. All right, youngins, what did you guys talk about today? The same thing you did there in the sermon. Which was? The same scripture. That they had a different twist on it. Oh, so you talked about Palm Sunday. Mm -hmm. Oh, that was a that was good timing that you had that lesson for today. <laughs> what was your different twist? What did you guys talk about? I'm sorry, I'm deaf. I can't hear you. She said Mike Trout. <laughs> I was comparing him coming back to Mobile to Jesus in that it was a really big deal. I was trying to think of like like a celebrity coming a to celebrity town. Coming okay. <laughs> I hear you. I hear you. Um, as a as a nobility, I would be impressed to, to see my crowd again. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. He lives near my parents. Yeah. Mm. yeah. Well, that's cool. Well, would you guys be ready to help us pray tonight? Oh, everybody sounds really excited. I'm going to give you guys a choice tonight. Okay. We can pray like we did last week, where we all stood up and prayed together at the same time. Or we can take turns and have different people lead us in prayer together. Which would you guys prefer? We'll all pray together. All pray together. All right. Anybody else? All right. We're all praying together. So if you'd like to or are able, you can stand up. We're going to do the Dear Jesus and then pray out loud. You can pray for yourself, you can pray for one of our prayer requests, whatever you want to pray for, but we're all going to pray together at the same time, out loud, okay? Yeah. Are we ready? You going to pray with me, Orky? You ready? Stand up. Yeah, let's stand up and pray. You wanted to pray like this, didn't you? Yeah. 
Yeah. Yeah, okay. You don't have to come forward, but I need to know there's going to be at least one other voice out there praying. <laughs> all right. Are we ready? Awesome. Well, I'll start us off and we can all pray. Dear Jesus, thank you. Thank you for loving us and caring for us. Thank you. Thank you for the Gospel of John yes. and this chance to read this word together. Father, thank you for this truth, for showing us right. who Jesus is. Yes. And thank you so much for this, this adopted love. Father, thank, thank you, you that we can be adopted into your family. Yes. Father, it makes thank me so you. happy that we thank can be adopted as your children, that we can all be part of this family. That any person can be here. Father, thank yes. you so yes. much. We lift up our brothers and sisters who are ill today. We especially pray for Daryl, Father. We pray that you would be with him on his journey, that you would touch him physically, and that you would be with him spiritually and emotionally. Yes, yes. Father, thank you for this chance to be together. And thank you for Holy Week. Thank you for this chance to celebrate what Easter means, Father. Thank you for an empty tomb. Amen. Father, thank you that we get to have life. Amen. Thank you, Father. Thank you. Yes. Please be with us. Help us to dive into your word, Father. Help us to be conformed to the image yes, of your Son. Help us to be transformed by the renewing of our minds. Yes, Help us to be yours through and through, wholly yes, devoted yes. to you, yes. consecrated and sanctified holy. Yes, amen. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Good job, guys. Good job. So if you have other ideas of ways you would like us to pray, we can try different patterns as well. So let me know if you'd like to try a different way of praying, and we can workshop it. Yes. Don't forget, next Sunday is Easter. We're not having an evening service. Don't forget to pray for evening Lisa's house. Yes. Oh, I did. sorry. Yes. Okay. Um, Pastor Tom did, but we did get an extra prayer request for, for Cisco. He had some testing waiting for results. Please add him to your prayer list as well. Okay. Um, well, thank you guys for coming, and have a blessed night. And I guess uh, we'll see you for communion. Have a good night. Thank you. Thursday. Thursday. Yes. What time? 7 p.m. Thursday and Friday. Okay. We'll see. We're, we're going to have communion on Thursday for Holy yeah. Thursday. We celebrate the last Sunday. Yeah. That's at 7 p.m. And then on Friday, also at 7 p.m., we're going to have a good Friday service. So that service is the remembrance of the day that Jesus died, the day that he was crucified. So Thursday celebrates the Last Supper. Friday, we remember the day that Jesus died. And then Easter Sunday is when we celebrate when he rose again. So that way, our time of Holy Week follows the same schedule. So today, Palm Sunday starts that. So the, the day, Palm Sunday, was one week before resurrection. So the days that we follow this week follow the schedule of that week in, in history. So Jesus came for, you know, just for shorthand, Jesus came into Jerusalem on a Sunday. He was arrested on Wednesday, or sorry, on Thursday night, and executed oh, the Episcopal. Friday night, yes. and then rose again on Sunday. Yeah. We had a big breakfast also. So our services follow that same schedule. Yeah. Bye-bye. Oh, sorry, I just left Facebook on. So I explained all of that to Facebook, too. <laughs> well, now everybody else knows our Holy Week schedule. Yay. Um, have a good night. Good night. Uh, good night, Ivelisse. Good night, Mom. Good night, Jane. Good night, Eric. Good night, um, I think that's all we got on here. But good night, everybody. Good night, Irene. Good night. <laughs>